there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our ongoing study of Paul's second letter to Timothy, uh, we are in the, second, in the third chapter, and we'll be starting in verse 6 and 7 today, having just finished verse 5 last week in our last session. So we're going to do that. Before we do that, I'm going to ask my sweet patootie, my wife Alice, to ask for God's blessing on our time together in his word. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And we ask you, Lord, to guide and direct this study tonight. We ask you to bless the words that come out of the butcher's mouth. And we just trust in you, Lord. Trust in you with all of our hearts and with all of our beings. We praise you. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, as I said, we, we finished up last week talking about the people who hold to a form of godliness but deny the power thereof in verse 5, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start reading on in verse 6 and 7. Talking about those men that Paul says we're to avoid, right? For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. For among them, right? The them here are the ones who hold to the form of godliness, yet deny the power. That's what talk, Paul's talking about. And as we said earlier, the power is the Holy Spirit within us, enabling us to boldly proclaim the love of God, the word of the cross. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 5 eight. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Predators will often, most of them, I think, but not always, seek out the weak. Yes. People who are in error when it comes to the word and a right relationship with the Lord also often seek the weak. The predators. Mm -hmm. They do not want to be confronted with the rightly divided word of truth. Our weapon, right? That's our weapon. We're the sword of the word, which always exposes their evil ways. They want to avoid them, so they'll look for the weak. Now, sorry about weak women weighed down with sins. Now, while the world and most of the church really doesn't want to hear this, and so choose not to hear it. The word of God says, 1 Peter 3, 7, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman. Show her honor as a fellow heir of grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. The word of God says that women are weaker. Yeah. It's not still wrong with them. No, and they're still to be honored, okay? And it's about the fact that the men of God are supposed to protect the women of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. So having said that, what the Apostle Paul actually wrote here, so don't take away from the word, he's talking about women weighed down with sin. Okay? Weighed down by sin. That's important. Yes. Because a godly woman, filled with the Spirit and the love of God, will walk in the power of God yes. and woe to the one who comes against her. I mean, because Alice has as much power in the spirit as I do. That's right. Okay? Now, because am I, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. Am I protective of Alice? Absolutely. Yes. Yes is right. <laughs> yes. But that this I still you gotta understand because this is talking about women who are weighed down by sin. Okay? Women walk in godliness and you'll walk in the strength of the Lord, the strength you, of the spirit. You have stewardship over me. Amen. Amen. So you need to be protected by I, I absolutely correct, right? I mean the scriptures are filled with the accounts of the faithful women who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Because they didn't love their lives even unto death, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it says in Revelation 12, 11. So they, they are that way. But sin will weaken any believer. Yes. We are to avoid those who reject the word of the cross. 
The act which sets the captives free. That's what the word does, right? That's what Jesus said. The Lord does not want us surrounded by those who are weighed down with sin, but his word recounts the faith of the saints who have gone on before us and says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, aside, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race it set before us. Hebrews 12, 1, right? So you don't want to try and do run with, you know, 80 pounds of, of dead weight on it. What you want to do is stay focused and strong in the Lord, all right? So I, I'm not going to pursue that much longer. I want, let me I want to go on to verse 8. Just as Janus and John Reyes opposed Moses, so these men, again, talking about those who are holding to a form of godliness denying the power, they're being religious but not being truly spiritual. These men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. Now, I want you to know there's no mention of those two by name anywhere else in Scripture. But this once is enough to know that in opposing Moses, they had opposed God's truth. Absolutely. That's all it takes is this one dime. But it, it generally has been accepted in Jewish tradition that these two, Genesis and John Marys, were magicians in the court of Pharaoh who tried to counter the miracles of God wrought at the hand, hand of Moses. Okay? That's a tradition that goes back, I mean, so far back into Jewish tradition. But you'd never find that out if you were just reading the Bible. You just did? No, no, but you just, you, you know that you, you have the names, but not the context. Well, the context is that they opposed Moses. Yeah. Okay, so that was kind of back that. then. So let me just read Exodus 7. I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before the Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Remember this? Mm -hmm. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Now, Paul, who, who was Saul of Tarsus, had been exceptionally well trained by Gamaliel. That's what it says in Acts 22.3, who was one of the most notable, one of the greatest teachers of Judaism that, that, that there was. So Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, As I, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, Galatians 1.14. So this was a tradition that had been carried forth from the Jews. He, that's where Paul would have gotten this information. And Paul, as, as spiritual as he was, would not have readily accepted anything that he had not tested. Okay, So he's got some basis for this. So it's no wonder that he would know those two names here, right? Mm -hmm. But bear in mind, this is not about ancient history, okay? It's not about ancient history. This is about what true believers will find in the perilous last days. People who will come against and try to negate the word, the word and the work of God. That's what he's saying, right? There are people who are always trying to stop the power of God, his word. So in verse 9 it says, But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and John Marys' folly was also. It didn't work for the Pharaoh or his magicians, who, by the way, the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah to say, The advice of the Pharaoh's wisest advisors has become stupid. That's Isaiah 19.11. And I'm going to tell you something. It is stupid to oppose God. It is stupid to turn from the Word of God. It, it didn't work back then, and it's not going to work today. So Paul was on, and in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15, he said, Therefore it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, mm -hmm. whose end will be according to their deeds. If it was going on back then, it's going on now. You know, that, that's a fact. The enemy can keep on saying, I will, I will, I will. You know, yes. Isaiah 14, 14. I'll do this. I'll make myself like the most I have. But the Lord has said, nevertheless, 
you will be thrust down to show to the recesses of the pit. Isaiah 14 and 15. So that's that's the power of positive thinking. Yes. You can be positive and you can you can think positively all you want. But if it doesn't line up with the word of God, if it's contrary to the word of God, you are in for a very rude awakening. Those who practice sin will eventually try to hide in the darkness while the righteous will let their light shine to the glory of God. That's, that's what it means. And, you know, let your light shine. We, we, we've got to be living the word of God. Don't hide your light under a bushel basket. Let it shine. Zipping right along, verses 10 and 11, Paul says to Timothy, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. So he's saying that the minute you follow my teaching, yes. okay? The King James says, instead of follow, it says, thou hast fully known. Timothy knew Paul, which is more than just knowing about him. There's a difference between the two, okay? Well, I know a lot of, uh, about Paul, but I don't know Paul. I hope, I look forward to a time when I do know him. But there are a lot of people who know about God, but don't know God. Paul's life was an open book, in the book. Mm -hmm. And he would write to the church in Corinth and to us to say, and this is a bold statement, he said, be imitators of me, even as I am of Christ, right? That's uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. That's, that's an incredibly bold statement. But take time to read 2 Corinthians 11, 22 to 28. Paul was a man, you want to write that down? But I'm, I'm serious. Take time to read this. Well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing now, but if, you, if you're not familiar with it, which is Paul's part of Paul's testimony, go do it. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 22 to 28. Because Paul was a man with a testimony. And his testimony is just revealing the truth of God's word. What's it saying? Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. I mean, this is what Paul's saying. He, his persecutions and sufferings and things that happen to him, his perseverance. We all do that. I mean, the, many of the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, like he delivered Paul, will deliver you. Just stay strong, stay faithful. It also reveals that Paul practiced what he preached. And brother, you better be doing that. Because he said in Romans 8.35, Starting 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Romans 8, 35 to 37. Paul believed that. He, I mean, he had most testimony usually comes after you've had a test. I mean, it doesn't. My testimony is not that somebody took me out for an ice cream Sunday. My testimony is that I've I've been there, done that, and God delivered me. Your testimony is car accidents and cancer. Well, <clears throat> our testimony is. That Satan tried to stop us over and over, and God delivered us. And that should be, that's it. I'm telling you, whether you recognize it or not, or see it or not, when you are walking in faith, that's going to be your testimony. Right? God is faithful, and he never fails. And you better be prepared for this. You absolutely better be prepared. Because what's the next verse say? Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Mm -hmm. All who desire to live God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, it says in Joshua, Joshua 21, 20, uh, 2145, not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. 
And don't forget that God spoke to Jeremiah in the first chapter from that book and said he watches over his word to perform it. This is the promise of God. Are you rejoicing in the promises of God? No. All who desire to live godly are going to be persecuted. That's the word of God. And the word of God can't be broken. Don't you love the promises of God? Yes. Is this verse a promise? Yes. Yeah, how do you know? Well, I'll, let me tell, tell you this, and it's important you understand this. The Hebrew word for promise is gavar. The Hebrew word for word, interestingly enough, is gavar. There is no difference between God's word and God's promise. Every word that he speaks is a promise. So if God has inspired, spoken through the Apostle Paul to say that in those perilous last days, all who desire to live God, they would be persecuted. You better be prepared for that. But the way you need to be prepared is by walking in the Spirit now, knowing, knowing that God will deliver you, that he is faithful. Yes, he is. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. These are the promises of God too. And every scripture is, well, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for the reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That's what Paul said here. We'll get to that a little more in 2 Timothy 3.16. I certainly don't think, as a matter of fact, I know that this is not a promise of God, the persecution. It's often heard in many large churches. No. They probably would not be large churches if, if this word was being heard. These are the days what's being preached in so many churches is self esteem mm -hmm. rather than self denial, which was certainly the teaching of Jesus, wasn't it? It's a time when the false prophets are telling the church to fill up their bank accounts rather than to store up the treasures in heaven. That's what's going on. That's what's going on. And those false teachers and prophets are proclaiming today, as in earlier times, peace, peace, when there is, when there is no peace. When they should be bringing a message that reminds us that Jesus had said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. That's a promise. That is a promise. Hallelujah. So when you hear these words, then we should understand that the peace of God that as Paul wrote to the Philippians surpasses all comprehension. Right? And will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. This is a peace that passes understanding here. If, if if you could understand, if it was natural, you could understand. You right. no, you wouldn't. Wouldn't be a question. No, you wouldn't. You'd be understanding. This passes understanding. It goes beyond that, right? Persecution should lead to testimony, mm -hmm. and testimony should lead to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. That's the deal. This Paul, whose life the Lord used so powerfully, I believe, had a seed sown in him by the visible testimony of Stephen when he was martyred for his faith. Let me just read you from Acts 7, verses 58 to 16. When they had driven him, talking about Stephen, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's Paul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against that, them. Having said this, he fell asleep. The great testimony were the words of Jesus Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them. This is the testimony of, of Stephen while he is being put to death. He's saying, you know, the same thing, different words. He's saying, Father, don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, heard that. Yes, he did. And that is the 
great proclamation of God's love. So that seed, seeing the Christ-like love of Stephen, bore fruit on the road to Damascus when Paul encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and then went on to change the world. And change the world he did. He's still doing it with his word, right? Because it says in Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame the enemy because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their own lives even when faced with death. Do you truly want to, you know, we, we, we think the idea is let's have coffee and donuts and invite people to come into our church buildings. And that, no, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what changes things. Testimonies of the power of God and the love of God. And that comes with tribulation, that comes with trials, that comes with the hard things. So he's talking about these, these men, right? So in verse 13, he continues on and says, but evil men and the impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Things are not getting better. Evil men and impostors. It is common for evil, both, both evil things and evil people, to come disguised as good. After all, they, it all originates with the father of lies, right? Who would make himself like the most high. That's what we read Isaiah 14, 14, right? Comes as an angel of light. Comes as an angel of light. Well, I would, I would read that too. Because all of these people that Paul is warning against here, who are enemies of the church and the God of the church, are very familiar to him as he wrote to the church in Corinth. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Paul wrote that to the church of Carmen, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13, 14, and 15. Those are the tares. Well, they are, but they, they come disguised as ministers of righteousness. Oh, so don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for your testing, Peter wrote, right? But these guys, these people, they're the blind leading the blind. That's what it says in Matthew 15. And they're both deceiving and being deceived. See, we're filled with the spirit of truth. And as such, we follow the command to abide in, to continue in Jesus' teaching, his word, which ensures that we know the truth, and that makes us free, right? That's what it says, John 8, 31 and 32. But we have to remember what the Apostle John wrote, particularly in these perilous last days. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4 1. Are you testing the spirits? I've said this a lot of times. Don't trust me. Test them. Test what I say. Test it against the, the scriptures. In verse 14 and 15 in, in chapter 3, Paul says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Continue in the things you have learned. You know, Paul had written to the church in Thessalonica and he said, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Second Thessalonians 3.13 You have to continue. You have to press on. You have to push on. you got to persevere. Those who endure till the end shall be saved, Jesus said, right? Continue in the things you have become convinced of. First, he said, continue in the things you've learned, but it's, a, it's saying, continue in the things you've become convinced of. The King James says that you're assured of. You can say that you believe, but are you convinced? Are you assured? Are you persuaded? You know, in the chapter that Paul wrote to the Romans, that I believe really defines him, he boldly proclaims, 
But in all these things, he's talking about the trials and tribulations. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 37 to 39. I, I can remember years ago, because this was kind of a phrase, somebody walking up to me and said, oh, they want to know what denomination I'm going to what persuasion are you? I said, I'm persuaded. I am persuaded. I am convinced. I know the love of God. When it comes to our faith, our words often proclaim what we would like to be true. But our actions will always proclaim what we are convinced is true. <clears throat> you can talk about how God's going to deliver you, but unless you live, like, you know, are you really, really convinced? Are you persuaded? Are you convinced? And we'll know that when we get to the persecution. Well, you know, we, we got to be faithful in the little things. Right? Because oftentimes it's, it doesn't take much to kind of bend us off the track. Well, we, we do go through little persecutions, and they'll be bigger. They'll, they'll be bigger. So be faithful in the little things. Right. If you run with the footman and they've tired you out, how will you, how will you run with the horses? It says, knowing from whom you have learned. Thank God for the faithful apostles, the prophets and teachers that the Lord has put in and used in our lives. But until we learn from the Lord himself, the spirit of truth, the teachings will not truly change our lives. Listen to what I'm saying. I've often said, and I just said it here, as I teach, don't trust me, test me. In Thessalonica, when Paul, when the unbelieving Jews had caused an uproar in the city, it says, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures to see whether these things were so. Acts 17, 10 and 11. When you examine the scriptures, talking to the Lord about what, what you've heard, all right, then you'll become convinced when you hear from the Lord. You'll become persuaded. You will, like Paul, overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, walking always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. When you have heard it from the Lord, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. you got to hear it from Jesus. It's not enough to say, well, my pastor says. You better be able to say with all boldness, the Lord says, God says. Amen. And I'm going to tell you more of what God says when we come back together again next week. Because once again, tempest fugit, as they say. Flies. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord. We, th we truly give you thanks. For those faithful brothers and sisters to have gone on before us, faithful witnesses of your power and of your love and of your deliverance. Lord, help us to be convinced of your love for us. Help us, Lord, to know that, like that be the rock upon which we stand, your Son Christ Jesus, because that is the evidence of your love. We praise you and thank you. Well, until next week, God bless you. Live it. Believe it and live it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye. Bye.